Muy buenas tardes, eh, bienvenidos al Instituto Cervantes de, Man de Leeds y Manchester, a nuestro canal de YouTube. Welcome to uh, Instituto Cervantes Leeds and Manchester's YouTube channel. Today we continue with our delicioso uh, series, a whole program of events around Spanish gastronomy and wine culture. We are very pleased to present Professor Maripat Morena Madrid, a culinary history. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Maripat, for accepting our invitation. This is a very exciting book which shows just how integral uh, gastronomy is to culture and identity of people and countries. In her work, Maripaz, the author, quotes the great writer Emilia Pardo Bazán, who considered that there are dishes in the Spanish national cuisine that are no less interesting or historical than medals, weapons, or even a bow. And I think this is so important, gastronomy. It sums up what gastronomy represents, something that unites us from within and opens us up to other cultures. Today, Spain is one of the most innovative uh, countries in the world of food, but it's also very traditional. Food is a matter of identity and Madrid is considered one of the most interesting foodie towns in the world. This is perhaps due to the wide variety of uh, specialty dishes that is cuisine both, ranging from the old traditional to the very modern. Not to mention that Madrid is also a melting pot with immigrants all over the, from all over the world and uh, in recent times, especially from Latin America. Anyway, for a closer look at Madrid and the important gastronomy, as an uh, important gastronomy hub, Maripal Moreno will tell us about her book and our audience. You are welcome to ask questions through the chat. And now I will introduce our guest. Maripal Moreno is a poet, essayist, and literary critic. She holds a bachelor degree in Spanish philology from the Universidad de Alicante and also a PhD in Spanish literature from the Ohio State University. She is professor of Spanish in the Department of Romance, Languages and Literature at the University of Cincinnati. Her research focuses on Spanish contemporary poetry and the connections between food and culture. She is the author of Landmark's pieces of writer Juan Gil Albert, Among el Culturalismo en la Poesía de Gil Albert, and the edition of his complete poetry with the editorial uh, pretextus. She is the editor of the Cincinnati Romance uh, Review Monography, issue writing about food, culinary literature in the Spanish world. She is also author de La Pagina al Plato, El Libro de la Cocina de España, and Madrid, a Culinary History. Books considered by the critics to be groundbreaking studies on the topic of food studies in Spain. She has published nine books of poetry and has been included in numerous anthologies. Her latest books is Amiga del Mostro and it was published last year. So thank you again, Maripa, for being with us and let us start with our talk. So first of all, how did uh, the idea of writing a book about the gastronomy in Madrid come, come about? Thank you, Pedro. First, I wanted to say thank you so much for the invitation uh, to, to be here. Uh, for me, it's always very exciting to talk about food and culture, two of my favorite topics. And thank you to everybody who's, who's attending the talk. So how did the, the idea come about? Um, so maybe I should backtrack a little bit. So my area of academic work really is, has nothing to do with, with food. Uh, my main area of specialty is really poetry. That's where I got started, that's where I did my dissertation. So that's what I was doing when I was hired at the University of Cincinnati. Uh, but then eventually I wanted to branch out, do something different. And I attended a talk that was very impressive for me. I attended a talk at the University of Cincinnati uh, by this woman called Cara de Silva. She had recently edited a book called In Memory's Kitchen. And this book was a collection of recipes that had been written by a group of women who were in a concentration camp during the, uh, the, the Nazi occupation. Um, this, this camp, you may have heard of this camp, it's called Teretzian or Teretzin. It was a very famous concentration camp where a lot of intellectuals were sent. 
So anyway, these women were there and of course they were very hungry. So one of their favorite ways of um, escaping their reality of the moment was to talk about food and to talk about the recipes that they used to cook for their families, the things that they wanted to cook again when they, uh, you know, when the nightmare was over. And so one of these women asked the others to write down their favorite recipes and then she collected them and uh, made a book with them, just, you know, saw it by hand. And so she created this manuscript uh, and uh, she was not sure if she would survive the war. So she gave the manuscript to a friend of hers and said, uh, if I don't survive, please make sure that this book uh, gets to my daughter's hands. Uh, she did not survive the war, unfortunately. The war ended and about 25 years later, the daughter of this woman was living in Manhattan at the time and she got a phone call and somebody said, are you Amy Steiner? I have a packet for you from your mother. And so they gave her the manuscript that had been written, as I said, in the concentration camp. So anyway, about 40 years later, this woman called Cara de Silva edited the manuscript. She edited the manuscript both in German and in, and in English. And she was presenting it at the University of Cincinnati. She was telling the story of the book and she even prepared some of the dishes. And I remember being so impressed, so struck by this story. I thought it was so powerful. I had never thought about food as anything else than food, right? And all of a sudden I thought food can be a lot, a lot more. It can have, it can be a historical artifact. It can be a testimony. It can be so many things. And I started thinking, has anybody done this with Spanish food? Has anybody looked at Spanish cookbooks or food in this way from a historical perspective? So I started doing research and I realized that nobody had done that. Uh, we had a lot of historias de la gastronomía or manuals that gave us basically the story of what people ate, but not really, not really analyzing, not really reading between the lines. So I started doing my own work, my own research, and I wrote the book that you mentioned before, De la Pagina al Plato, from the page to the plate, where I did a study of Spanish cookbooks from the 14th century all the way to the 20th, 20th, 20th century, looking at why they were written, who wrote them, uh, what was happening behind the, the recipes, what was the story behind the recipes. So that was kind of my, my uh, kind of a long way of, of going into food studies. But, but then I was really hooked about the topic. I found that food and culture are very fascinating topics, very interesting ways of looking at, at history. And so I wanted to do more of that. And I wanted to also write in English. And then I saw a call for proposals that uh, Ken Albala, the editor of the series of uh, Big City Food Biographies put out, he put out a, a call for proposals. The series uh, had published just a few books and they were mostly American cities, New Orleans, um, I forget it was San Francisco, I can't remember. So I wrote to him and I said, would you be interested in a book about a European city? And he said, yes. So I, I put together a proposal about Madrid and, um, and it was accepted and yeah, I went on to, to do the research and, and wrote the book. So yeah, long story, but you know, good things take time. So yes, yeah, it took me some time. <laughs> so it was just by coincidence that you were struck so, so impressed from this history of this woman from the, the Nazi sites that it changed your, your path in a certain way. Absolutely, yes, yes. Sometimes uh, the smallest things can take you to, you don't, you don't know where, right? Yeah, as I said, it's a very, very impressive, very exciting book. And um, yes, Spain is a country with many faces and a melting pot itself, many cultures. Every dish has a past, a whole memories, reflects the Spanish history as everywhere, but in a very diverse uh, country like Spain, that is very, very obvious. Particular relevant is the influence of the Arab, the Jewish, and later the Christian uh, cultures. How these realities, these rich and also complex realities, reflected in Madrid cuisine? There are a lot of dishes uh, that are typical of Madrid that, that do have either Jewish or Arab uh, roots. You can see that, especially the desserts, for example, desserts that have a lot of honey, desserts that have a lot of different nuts and things like that would probably be, you know, inherited from, from uh, Jewish, uh, Moriscos, uh, Arabs. Um, they, were, they were a very important presence in Spain, not just Madrid. 
And uh, to this day, you can see uh, the influence in many, in many dishes. Take, for example, cocido, right? The cocido, the, the chickpea stew that is considered the quintessential Madrid dish. Some scholars believe that it may be um, originated with the adafina, which is a, a Jewish uh, stew. But then, of course, you know, uh, pork was added um, to show that we were good Christians. If you were a good Christian, you would eat, eat pork. So the adafina was basically a stew that was done during the Sabbath so that you wouldn't have to cook or you know, really cook during the Sabbath. And, um, and the cocido is very similar. Of course, it has modern additions like the potatoes. Those are a more recent addition and it has the pork added. But uh, basically, um, a lot of the stews like that or the fabada, uh, in other parts of Spain, there's a lot of stew dishes that um, could be could be considered, you know, of inherited from from Jewish people, for example. Well, adaptation, no, you adapt it, no, and then the Christians put the accent on putting pork. Uh, so the people, if you don't eat that, they were suspicious with the Inquisition and all those those matters. Yeah, so it's very important. Um, a key element of the evolution of Madrid's uh, gastronomic cuisines was when it was declared, declared the capital of Spain in the 16th century. What impact had this declaration of Madrid as the capital of Spain? It was a rather small town or village, and then was uh, before and after that. How was the impact? How changed the whole city gastronomy, this uh, new reality? Mm -hmm. A lot of things happened after 1561 when, when it was declared the, the capital, right, by the, the king, Philip II. Uh, first of all, as you were saying, it was a small town and all of a sudden the court had to be there. So a lot of people started arriving to this small town. Uh, there were not enough places to live. There were not enough places to eat. So a lot of things started to open up. Uh, they needed to find lodging. They needed to find, um, yeah, places to eat. Uh, to accommodate all the people that accompany the, the king. And that uh, tr translated into a huge, a huge uh, growth, a really an explosion of, of the population and um, the food industry in general. And also then you had the sophisticated taste of the royals, right? One way to show, uh, one way to show wealth or to show prosperity for the, the kings was to give these enormous, ridiculous, impossible banquets where they had 50 or 60 dishes uh, prepared. Um, and so that needed to be prepared, that needed to be provided. So every day there would be hundreds of animals or thousands of animals being slaughtered and you know all the, all the things that come along with, with all these big banquets. Uh, that created an industry um, and, and, and also created this culture of Madrid being a melting pot. You know, in the US, they talk a lot about being a melting pot, but Madrid really is a, a melting pot. Uh, you start having people from everywhere coming there. And to this day, uh, you have people from all over Spain and really all over the world that arrive to Madrid and they, once you get to Madrid, you are from Madrid. That's what a friend of mine told me, right? So you have restaurants that reflect the specialty of every cuisine. In, in, the, in the Iberian Peninsula. You have fantastic Galician restaurants or Valencian restaurants or you know, all, the, all the different regions. And that is, part of, that is part of Madrid, right? Everything, you can find everything, the best fish, the best meat, the best um, vegetables, all that stuff. Uh, but yeah, it definitely started once, uh, it went from a really tiny small town to the, the, the kingdom, right? The place where the court was set, so yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, you also mentioned, in, speaking about the royals and this uh, royalty habits in, uh, in, in eating, that uh, they didn't eat a lot of uh, vegetables and fruits. They were considered un unhealthy. Yes, the doctors back then have very different ideas uh, than we do have now about what a healthy diet is. They did not recommend fruit. The, they, you could eat fruit, but only if it was candied, if it was covered in sugar, then it was okay, right? Or a la sartén, as they call it, so it was cooked. Uh, but definitely no raw fruit. I can see the raw element me maybe being a little dangerous, but uh, in general, they just thought that meat was the only the best and most healthy, healthiest uh, food. And that's very interesting because one thing that you can see with food is that there's definitely a class uh, reading, right? I mean, the people from the lower classes ate mostly bread, wine, 
um, some cheese, uh, some vegetables, but they didn't eat meat regularly, for example. Uh, in the, at the same time, the, the royals, the nobility, they ate meat often because they could, and that was a way of, of showing their status. So there was definitely a class division in what people ate. And um, yeah, the problem is that many kings uh, developed things like gout, uh, issues like that, and uh, their doctors then prescribed more meat and less vegetables because <laughs> that's how you're gonna get better. It just didn't work out very well, but yeah, that's what they did, yeah. Yeah, I was remembering uh, the King uh, Alfonso XIII, which would be, I guess, the great-grandfather of Philip VI, uh, the king now. Um, he fell in love with fried potatoes. Um, and so for his breakfast, and I, I, I was- I see the book, yeah. Yes, for his breakfast, he had fried eggs every single day, sorry, fried potatoes every single day for breakfast uh, with roast chicken, chicken, with veal chops, with beef steak, with mutton, with beef again, scallops of veal. So every morning his breakfast was meat and fried potatoes, plus four poached eggs and 12 biscuits. That was his breakfast. <laughs> so <laughs> very different from what we would consider today a, a healthy breakfast, I guess. <laughs> Yes, and also uh, there was uh, the evolution and the influence. Uh, there was a certain time with the influence from the French, uh, French gastronomy that the menus were written in French rather than in Spanish, yeah? Yes, Spain had for many centuries, I would say, an inferiority complex with respect with, to France. So everything that was French was better, right? Uh, best feel philosophy, art, painting, music, and of course, food. So that extended to, to many aspects of, of Spanish culture. And, you know, many intellectuals of the 19th century also were educated in France, and they brought, you know, new ideas to Spain, who, which is, it might be fair to, to say that Spain was a little behind in some uh, ideological aspects. Um, but yeah, food was one of those areas. And uh, yeah, the royal menus for the big banquets were, were written in French. It is only uh, during the 19th century that some intellectuals like Emilia Pardo Bazan and other writers, they, they start to advocate, let's make this Spanish. Spain has its own culture. We should write the menus in Spanish. And uh, eventually some changes happened. Yes, but it took, it took uh, some work and some of these intellectuals to, to write these essays that were published in the, in the local newspapers to convince people that Spanish food was in fact better than French food and that um, no matter what anybody says, we invented the consomme, we invented the croquettes, maybe, maybe not. But anyway, this, uh, there was a strong, uh, strong um, movement to defend uh, Spanish cuisine as something of value, which which I think is you know very important, really is. One character is very uh, Madrileños. They spend a lot of time in the street, uh, socializing with friends. So we cannot go without speaking about uh, the tapas culture, but very especially in Madrid. So let's speak about it. How is it? The tapas culture. Maybe most of our audience they have already been in Spain, some time, some maybe in, in Madrid or not. But I think it's something very special all over Spain, but especially in, in Madrid. Yeah, it's true. And it varies also depending where you are in Spain, right? What they give you for tapas or how much they give you. In Alicante, where I am right now, there is no such thing as free tapas. In Madrid, you get a free tapa with your drink. So, you know, there's, there's that. Uh, usually, so you get a, you order a drink, let's say you order a beer, a glass of wine, and they give you a little something. Could be a piece of bread with um, chorizo in it or ham, or it could be peppers. Uh, it could be, I mean, really a myriad things, right? Just small bites that accompany the, the drink. Uh, the idea in Spanish culture, the idea of just drinking is not mm, considered the right thing. When you, when you drink, you're supposed to eat something. You should not be drinking on an empty stomach for many reasons. Hmm? So usually drink is accompanied by, by food and that's where tapas come in. And so it has become this wonderfully bonding uh, activity. You go out with friends, you go out with family, you go to a bar or several bars and have a bunch of small little bites. Uh, you can make a dinner out of that. You can, it can be the pre-snack before your lunch, your comida. Um, 
It could be something I do mid afternoon, you know, it doesn't really, there are really not that many rules. Uh, it varies from region to region, but it's basically small dishes that you share, right? You get a big, a big plate and you can share with other people. So there's the, the bonding element. Unfortunately, uh, tapas uh, and, and tapas bars have been really hard hit during this pandemic, as you can imagine, right? Yes, of course. Everything was closed down, the tapas bars were closed down, the idea of sharing food it wasn't a good idea. So slowly it's it's coming back, it's recovering, but um, it's something that this pandemic, this pandemic has definitely changed the face of, of, of Madrid's um, bars and restaurants. It has changed a lot of things as we know. But, but yeah, tapas are fantastic. It's like a fantastic way of having an inexpensive dinner, I think. And you get a lot of variety, you try different things. Um, so yeah, I cannot recommend them enough. <laughs> yeah, and, and is there any, any uh, the roots of the tapas or uh, uh, how did it start? Because it's something very unique in Spain. I don't know any other country where the people go so off to the bars, not just to drink, as you mentioned, just to socialize, to have a, a good time. And then uh, just eat something, a small drink, but some people, more than once a day. It's not unusual. It's not just they are just uh, so uh, keen on, on drinking. It's the fact of socializing. How how did this uh, start the tapas? Uh, is that reality mainly related to the to the also to the Arab culture, or the, the fact of being outside uh, most of the time? But you know how, when 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 we can date it, uh, this tapas. Uh, I don't know if we can. Um, if you look in the internet, you will hear some really wonderful stories about a king that was really clumsy. So they made, they invented tapas for him. And But I don't think that's very accurate. I don't think you can really date it, to be honest, or at least I haven't been able to date it. Now, the word tapa may suggest that it was meant to cover the, the glass. And some people say to protect it against insects flying around, which could make sense, right? It's possible that to protect from flies coming in, that you put a tapa, you put a little lid, a plate with something. It's possible that is the origin and the name, right? Uh, but honestly, I don't know exactly when or where it originated. Yeah. It seems like something somewhat spontaneous. Yeah. Other cultures do have small dishes. Uh, there's this metze, I think they're called metze that they have in Lebanon, I believe, in other places. So other, other cultures do have small plates. Um, yeah that also shared? Yes, the medicine is, is all together and the fact of eating together and with the hands, that is right. also from the Arabic tra Arab tradition. Yes. So perhaps it's inherited from there? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. All, all, uh, there's always a dialogue. Um, a very important uh, part, of course, of a recipe is the ingredients and the markets are essential parts, yeah, where you buy those ingredients. Madrid has a very rich tradition in the markets. Can you tell us about, it's very, uh, very interesting. Uh, so many markets are so different. Can you explain a bit about it? Yes, book? yeah. So the markets really started, well, in a spontaneous way, right? The peasants would bring their products to the town, to the city, and they would sell them in a plaza, in a square. And then eventually that square um, would be the gathering place where the, all this shopping would be going on. Uh, but eventually they, they built structures to for safety, for cleanliness, for order, right? To make it more orderly. So these markets started to, 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 to originate, to appear. And now every, every neighborhood has a market or several markets. Um, that's where you can find the fresh vegetables, the fresh meat, everything, everything else. Markets have been suffering in recent years with the rise of supermarkets and big, um, yeah, big supermarkets or big grocery stores, right? Where you can buy everything in one trip. Uh, it's a lot easier. They have parking, blah, blah, blah. Everything is a lot easier. Uh, so they've been suffering a little bit from, from that. However, many of them are now coming back as a remodeled or reinvented gourmet spaces. And so you have the stalls where you can buy your vegetables and your products and your meat and your fish, but then you also have a bar, a little bar, or you have a place that serves gourmet something. Uh, and so it's a way of attracting people. Sometimes there's cultural events going on, maybe exhibits or concerts. It's a way of attracting people, especially young people, back to the markets. And that's been working quite well. Um, some of them 
um, have, have been doing quite well in that respect. Uh, there's also a really wonderful market in Madrid, it's called Mercado San Miguel. It's one of the oldest, really, um, and now it has been it has beautiful uh, structure. I, I, wanted, I wanted later on to show some photos. Maybe I can play some slideshow at some point um, and show some photos of the San Miguel market. Nowadays, San Miguel market is more of a tourist spot, but uh, it's definitely worth a visit. It's right next to Plaza Mayor. So if any of you go to Madrid and go to Plaza Mayor, do make it to San Miguel Market. They have wonderful food. A lot of stuff that you can eat already that is prepared for you right there, uh, from paella to, I don't know, champagne, really, and oysters. So yeah, anything you can imagine. But it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful structure, and it's kind of a nice way of looking at, at the old the old markets. But yes, there's so many variations, so many different markets in every neighborhood and um, wonderful and just really, really worth a visit. And some of them very popular also for the modest people, not only for the, mm -hmm. uh, the subscale, yes, and uh, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, in Madrid, of course, we have plenty of bars, taverns, chocolaterias, cafes, and even the what's considered the oldest restaurant in the world, Sobrino de Botín, frequented by Ed Hemingway. Uh, even there is an association of centenary, centenary restaurants. Can you tell us about all these different uh, locals one where you can enjoy food? What is, uh, how would we explain what is a tavern, una taberna in Madrid? Uh, or las chocolaterías, it's something very typical from Madrid. Yeah, so there's an incredible array of places to eat, right? From the cheapest to the most expensive and then fanciest. I was uh, also a little, I was reading some of the comments. Somebody was talking about Mercado San Miguel being closed, being open. As I said, the pandemic has changed everything. And especially some of the fanciest um, restaurants have suffered a lot. Some of them had to close during the pandemic. Some of them have opened maybe uh, only by appointment. Or they're still struggling to stay, to stay open like the Sobrino de Botín that you just mentioned. They had to close even though they're, according to the, to the Guinness uh, Book of World Records, they were the, old, the oldest restaurant in the world. They've been open since 17, I forget this, 1700s. Uh, so they closed during the pandemic. Now they reopened. Um, I'm not sure if as of today they are open. So yeah, that's happening with a lot of places, unfortunately. And like I said, the most expensive ones, the ones with Michelin stars are the ones that have suffered the most because those are the most expensive places to maintain and to keep running. Uh, the, you know, the, the, the tabernas are a lot more popular uh, where you can have your cayos, your tribe, you can have your, your small typical dishes and a nice uh, glass of wine uh, or vermouth. Those are, for the most part, I think they have reopened these days. And um, they're, they're wonderful. Um, they, they really are, the, they represent the, the flavor of Madrid in many ways. Um, some of them, they bag, yeah, they're over a hundred years old. And uh, you can tell sometimes the decoration, the furniture still <laughs> really shows their age. But uh, if you want an experience that's very, very much Madrilenia, I would, I would def definitely recommend that. The chocolaterias and the churrerias are also incredibly popular. San Ginés being perhaps the most popular. We know that, well, if you know a little bit about the history of chocolate, chocolate was brought uh, to, to Europe, to Spain, right? Uh, from the, well, the, the Mayas, the Aztecs, they were drinking chocolate and Cortes and his men um, figure out that whatever it is that they were drinking gave the, the, the people of, of uh, Moctezuma um, kind of close to superhuman strength. They, they realized that there was something to this drink. Um, the Spaniards didn't like chocolate when they first drank it because chocolate was drunk all the way until the 19th century. It was really a drink. It wasn't eaten in, in, in solid form. Uh, they didn't like it because it was bitter, it was spicy, it was thick, it was mixed with uh, chilies, it was something that they didn't like. But once they added sugar, they did figure out that it was edible. And so, yeah, it eventually made its way to, to Spain and it became the, the drink, uh, the fashionable drink. It was also a sign of status. If you could afford chocolate that came from the Indies, right? It was definitely a very popular drink for the nobility, the upper classes, um, 
the religious um, uh, priests, etc. Right, and so chocolate became, as I said, a very popular food. Uh, people drank it in the morning, the afternoon, the evening, three, four times a day. They were drinking chocolate, and to this day, chocolate remains uh, very popular uh, in Madrid and the rest of Spain. Chocolate, uh, well, you can eat it in, in chocolate bars, obviously, but a very traditional way of of consuming it is as uh, this very thick drink. I don't know where you are, but in the United States, what they call hot chocolates is really very thin, watered down version of it. I don't care for it. Uh, the Spanish chocolate has to be thick to the point where your spoon stands. You know, yeah. so, <laughs> and so then you, you dip in this churros, which is basically fritters, right? These uh, fried dough that has sugar in it, and which is also inherited from uh, the Arab um, the Arab. Um, the cultural heritage, really, right? The churros are, probably have an Arab origin. So if you dip this uh, fantastic churros in thick, dark chocolate, it's uh, it's quite a quite an experience. So yes, Chocolateria San Ginés would be my place of choice, um, where they really make churros all day long, and, and the chocolate is wonderful. Mm -hmm. And the cafes are, are very important, uh, rather than food as, as a meeting place, also for the intellectuals and with a history. There are cafes in Malibu are, which are very important in our history, Cafe Gijón and other uh, places where the people met and are still meeting for a tertulia, something very peculiar in Spain, yeah? Right, yeah, many intellectuals, yeah, they used to, to get together in these cafes and, uh, you know, with, uh, I mean, you have to realize like coffee, tea, chocolate, all these things kind of hit Europe at the same time. And it was really the first time that people were consuming these highly stimulant drinks. Um, and so, yeah, coffee coffee houses became all the rage in England as well, um, to the point where I think uh, they created some problems because they were kind of hotbeds of political dissent. And, um, and at some point they had to be, yeah, there were some, some problems there. But uh, yeah, a lot of intellectuals would get together at these cafes. Cafe Gijón, I understand, is, I think it's still open. Again, with the pandemic. It is, it is. Yeah. Yeah, I was I was there two weeks ago. So you go to Madrid, Cafe Gijón is still open. That's great. That's great. Yes, yeah. Um, the culture of cafes has changed somewhat because of the Starbucks of the world, right? Uh, in fact, many of these historic cafes are now Starbucks, or some of them. And so they, 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 the culture of cafes uh, has changed now with the internet. People go to the cafe and spend more time <laughs> looking at the computer than talking to other human beings in person, but they're still there. And uh, they definitely have played a, a role, a very important role in the history of Madrid. A lot of things happen in these cafes. A lot of uh, things happen in some of these restaurants, whether it was political deals or intellectuals exchanging ideas. Uh, so yes, <laughs> very, very important. Um, in Madrid, also in Spain as a whole, but uh, in the 60s, the menu del dia, the menu became popular, three courses for a modest price that can still be found in every corner in Madrid. Mm -hmm. How did this menu come about and how does it work exactly? So it was an idea of uh, the Franco government. Uh, the Franco government wanted to attract tourists for one, but also wanted to provide a cheap meal for the workers. So they, um, they did not really make it optional for restaurants. They kind of mandated that every restaurant would be offering a menu del dia or a, yes, a menu of the day. And it had to consist of three courses and um, dessert, uh, and it had to be affordable, had to be specific under a specific price. That tradition still is very much alive. Uh, pretty much every restaurant uh, offers a menu del dia, and it's a great, um, a great way of having a um, homemade, affordable meal. Um, so if you go to a restaurant at lunch time in Spain, you can you have the carta, which is the menu. You can choose from the carta; that's fine. But they usually have a set menu. Uh, usually, you have a first course, and you can choose between three or four things. A second course, same thing. So the first course may be salad or soup or maybe pasta. And then a second course is usually meat or fish, right? Um, and then you get a dessert, which usually is there's some homemade um, rice pudding or things like that, or fruit. 
which is also a very Spanish thing to have food for dessert and then coffee. And that could be what, 12 euros, 15 euros, between 10 and 15, in the nicer places, maybe it goes up to 20, but that would be up there, expensive. But yeah, it's yeah. a great way of having um, a nice, a nice uh, homemade, usually homemade lunch. Mm -hmm. uh, as you mentioned, yeah, two writers, uh, Benito Perez Galdós and Emilia Pardo Bazán, defended the Spanish uh, traditional uh, cuisine against innovation and rather the, to preserve the authenticity. How this idea of preserving authenticity has evolved with the time? Ah, that's, a, ooh, that's a complicated question. I guess authenticity is, an slippery, is a slippery word in a way, and a slippery concept, right? Because what is authentic? If yeah. every cuisine is the result of many cuisines and many civilizations and, and historical events uh, happening, right? They all leave their trace. Um, I don't know if you can, we can talk about a pure, authentic cuisine, right? Um, in Spanish, cuisine would not be what it is without all the wonderful products and foods that came from the Americas, for example. Can you imagine Spanish cuisine without potatoes, without tomatoes? So, you know, we owe them a lot in that respect, or without peppers, right? Paprika, peppers. Uh, um, so yeah, um, authenticity is, is kind of a, a difficult concept to, to grasp. Um, Cuisine and food, they're always evolving. They're, they're part of history. And uh, what we eat nowadays is very different from when my parents' generation ate or my grandparents' generation. So that's constantly evolving. There's a lot of foreign influences now, perhaps more than before. Um, we live in a global world and we all want to eat sushi and um, you know all these different things that we consider exotic and interesting. So Spanish cuisine is incorporating a lot of those foreign influences. I was in a restaurant recently here in Alicante. Uh, they do um, you know, a little bit of molecular gastronomy, a little bit of innovative things, and there's all these different um, ingredients. You have very Spanish things that could be um, cuttlefish or right things like that. But then you also have seaweed, and you have so you have all these different um, both ingredients and cooking techniques that have been incorporated from other from other places. So what's authentic? Whatever people are eating these days, I would say that's authentic enough for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, there are also in Madrid, uh, typical Madrid and also in other places of the, of the, of the country, um, the fact of drinking just water uh, was considered not uh, so interesting. So people tend to drink wine or wine as a as food, and then there drinks like agua de cebada or, or chata. Uh, can you speak a bit? Uh, so those authentic uh, uh, drinks that are rather peculiar in Madrid and also in other regions of Spain. Yeah, so yeah, exactly. Uh, also, a lot of uh, cold drinks became very popular in the 18th, 19th century. Once they, when they were able to bring, they would bring the snow from the mountains uh, to Madrid in big carts uh, covered with hay so that the snow wouldn't melt. And so with that snow, they would create all these um, cold, cold drinks, uh, or chata being one of them, or hipocras, some made with a little bit of honey uh, with uh, different plants. Um, Orchata, you can have orchata made with from almonds, basically almond milk, we will call. But uh, the other kind, uh, perhaps the most traditional one that is more typical of Valencia, is the one made with um, the chufa, which I think the English word is tiger nut, <laughs> uh, something like that. It's a, it's a little root. It's a very peculiar little thing, only grows in sandy soils, very specific um, temperature ranges. So it really only grows in Valencia. In the Valencia and Albufera. And then if you go to Northern Africa, for example, you're gonna find it too, Tunisia and places like that. Um, but uh, so, so yeah, chufa is, very, is a very specific, uh, very peculiar uh, fruit, but it, but it creates a, very, a really interesting milk, this whitish uh, milk. Agua de cebada, cebada, I, I can't remember the word for cebada in English. I, I, I also don't, really, don't know the, the word. I'm blanking on that. But anyway, it's another one of those uh, drinks that is made from, you know, some plant and then you add ice and you add some sugar. Barley, thank you. That barley, means, yeah. Yes, barley. barley, exactly. Yeah. So agua de cebada or barley water is another one. It's still, it's still drunk in many, many 
But uh, I would say the Mediterranean region is, is, quite, is quite popular there. Leche merengada, or these drinks made with, with milk that has a, a little bit of honey and lemon peel. So you have this, this drink uh, made from milk, regular milk. Uh, there's, there's a number of these things for sure, yeah. But yeah, water wasn't the safest. So drinking wine was actually a lot more recommended even for children. The idea that children wouldn't drink alcohol was not even a concept. So wine was the drink for everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I still remember when I was a child in the small villages in Guadalajara, they used to give to children uh, 60 years of age bread with wine and sugar. And it was considered very healthy and normal. When I tell my, my, my daughters that I ate uh, uh, bread with wine and sugar when I was six or seven, it's like uh, they cannot understand. So. <laughs> Yeah, that was given to children. Those traditions like, are about, have been evolved, but as you said, wine as was for everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have seen Madrid as uh, traditional, but also it's a very modern and avant-garde. Uh, how is the this uh, situation with the avant-garde, with the nouvelle cuisine, the molecular cuisine in Madrid? Uh, like I said, uh, the pandemic has changed many things, so I cannot give a very up-to-date account. Uh, before the pandemic, it was uh, very, very, it was, it was really going really well. A lot of interesting places opening all the time. You had some very innovative chefs. You have a Vignot, you have other chefs that are working in, if you go to, for example, Ponzano Street, I don't know if you had the experience of going to Ponzano Street, is a one street full of fantastic restaurants and they all are very, very innovative. They're, they're experimenting all the time. Um, so there was a lot of activity um, and a lot of very, a lot of innovative uh, cuisine going on. The pandemic has closed some of those places and now they're struggling to, to stay open. I know that for example, um, I think it's called, it was called uh, there was this Mexican restaurant that was very popular and very, upscale and they had to close. Uh, there were a number of places that had to close for good. Uh, so, but I think it will come back. I think it's coming back already. And I think um, the influence of Ferran Adria is unquestionable. Uh, all these uh, techniques that he came up with uh, have really taken root in many restaurants. I think there's um, there's a desire to balance this, this, this idea, not just make everything extreme. Uh, I mean, gastronomy cuisine, you know, molecular, molecular gastronomy is very interesting, but it's also very expensive and very difficult to, to use all the time. So yeah. I think some of the elements that they use are really interesting and really valid, uh, but I think people are trying to find a balance because there's also a way of uh, desire from people's part to return to some basic flavors, basic, um, foods. Um, there's a lot of nostalgia. I think uh, some of the you know, people who go to restaurants want to wanna have some traditional dishes as well. So oftentimes you have a traditional dish with a twist, with yeah. a modern twist. I think that's happening a lot. So yeah, I think, um, I think time will tell. The next months will be very critical to see which restaurants uh, survive, which close and which ones open, right? Because I think there's going to be also some new restaurants opening up. Uh, there's a resurgence, for example, of um, old-fashioned bakeries. Uh, people are now crazy about bread. During the pandemic, yes. everybody was baking, and now people want to eat good bread. So there's all this, uh, there's a whole set of uh, bakeries, not only in Madrid, really everywhere you go, traditional old-fashioned bread. So things like that are really coming back, which I think is very exciting. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, okay, so now we, uh, we open the, the debate uh, with our audience. So we, we start uh, uh, with, sorry. If I, yeah, if I may, can I share, just share my screen? You can play with, it's just a uh, slides, images. From yes, the, yes, of course you can. You can uh, have it as a background. So yes. So yeah, you're seeing images of cocido and places that make cocido and uh, different shops around the city. I just, when I, I went to, when I was working, you know, on the research for the book, I just went to Madrid and tried to see as much as I could, eat as much as I could, visit every market and every shop and just photographed as, as all the places that I thought were interesting. So this is what, what we are seeing. But yes, I'm happy to answer questions. Okay, Carlos, go ahead. Yeah. 
We have a, a few questions and, and comments. Uh, for example, Michael Hagen uh, said, when in Madrid, I used to like going to Los Museos de Jamón. I have not seen them in other cities. Are they unique to Madrid? I believe it's a chain that is only in Madrid. I have only seen them in Madrid as well. And I think it's a chain just in Madrid, yes. Yeah, great place for a good bocadillo, right, right? Yeah, 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 so fun. Fun places to hang out, for sure. Also, uh, Danny Baker uh, has two questions. Has there been any research into how South America has evolved from the mix of Spanish and indigenous food? Yes, there, there is tons of research, absolutely tons. And also South America is really big. So it's very different if you're talking about Mexico, if you're talking about Argentina, if you're talking about um, you know, Uruguay. I mean, all these different countries have very different uh, histories. I work a little bit on the, on the cuisine of Mexico and the relationship between Mexican cuisine and Spanish uh, cuisine or Spanish food and Mexican food, because it's, uh, it's fascinating. And there's so much going on there that that would be a whole other talk. But yes, to answer your question, yes, there is a lot of research and it's a fascinating area of, of, of work. Yes. Mm -hmm. And his second question is, how do you think Madrileño food will evolve with the increase in veganism and vegetarianism? vegetarianism? Ah, that's a very good question. Yes, because as you can see in some of these images, Spanish food is a lot about the meat, right? Jamón is very important, meat is very important. But it's true that uh, vegetarianism and veganism are taking hold. It remains to be seen how much it will change things. I know that as of today, you can, there's a lot of good vegan restaurants. You can find some chefs that are working more with vegetables than they used to before. So yeah, there's more, there's more alternatives now, more options. I don't think jamon is going to disappear from our <laughs> pantry just yet, but uh, perhaps we will see um, more, more vegetable dishes. Sure, it's possible, it's very possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, more questions. Uh, well, uh, in my case, I would like to ask you, uh, how is the influence of the, you know, that the wine and the food, it, it's all related. And in the last, in the recent year, we have the uh, Denominación de Origen, Madrid. Uh, how you think it's gonna be the influence of the wine and the wines from Madrid in, the, in, the, in this food, in this culture, in this astronomy? Mm. Wine is right now a very hot market. It used to be that only wines from La Rioja were the good Spanish wines. And I, I have to say I'm completely partial because my family is from La Rioja. So if you ask me, Rioja is the best wine, right? <laughs> but you know, they've been making wine for a long time and they do really good wines. And they used to be the only, the big player, right? Uh, but then now we have Rivera del Duero, and now we have vinos or wines from Madrid. We have wines from Alicante as well. We have many regions are start, starting to make really good wines, really good wines. Uh, the market is really hot. A lot of the wine they make gets exported to places like, well, yeah, England or definitely the United States. Uh, so I think Madrid is trying to jump on this wagon, and it's a big market, big, exciting market. And if they can make good wines and make a name for, the, a name for themselves, um, yeah, they would be competing with all the other ones. Um, I wonder if at some point the wine market will just be saturated with all these regions and people will be really confused, like, so what shall we drink? <laughs> but um, I think a lot of people are making really good wines everywhere. So, yeah, I don't see why we should just stay with the old fashioned, try something new. Mm -hmm. Well, Sarah asked, what is your favorite tapas dish? <laughs> well, my favorite tapas dish, I really like things like pulpo, octopus. Um, octopus is one of my favorite things to eat. Um, and I know some people don't eat octopus. They think it's barbaric. They've seen this fantastic documentary on Netflix about the octopus that befriends the diver and all that. I know, I know, I know octopus is very smart, but I like it. Um, but I also like patatas bravas, and I talk about them in the book a little bit, um, about uh, this, uh, what Spaniards understand by brava sauce or spicy sauce would make a Mexican laugh out loud because it's really not that spicy. 
uh, but we call them bravas, right? So you have fried potatoes, usually fried potatoes with a sauce that has um, usually paprika, hot paprika. Some places they have tomato, tomato sauce. Um, but other places they don't, and it depends on you know who you ask what the real recipe is. But in any case, these potatoes with the spicy sauce is uh, which there is the photo, perfect timing. Uh, it's one of my favorite tapas as well. So yeah, I would recommend. Oh, and pulpo, of course. Yeah, that's <laughs> my favorites. I would say. Well, Paul Hughes asks, how did permut become a tradition in Madrid? Oh, I don't know exactly how it became a tradition, to be honest. I know it's been a tradition, I would say, since the 19th century that it became a popular thing to, to do and to drink. But I haven't really looked at the origins of vermouth or the history of vermouth. So I cannot tell you exactly when it started. I can, I, I'm going to have to look it up. I'm sorry, I cannot give you any more info. I know that it's very popular and there's a lot of places. You can go to La Ardosa, you can go to all these different places like the one that's on the screen right now for a vermouth and it's a pre-meal drink. Um, usually it's infused with uh, herbs, right? And depending on where you are, not just in Madrid, if you're in other parts of Spain, it's going to have different herbs to infuse it. It's an art, making good vermouth is an art. Um, but I cannot tell you exactly when it got started. Mm, I would say 19th century. That's my best guess. Oh, another question by Rossi Bell Guzman. What affordable establishment do you think is uh, often overlooked by tourists? Can you repeat the question? Which, which establishment? What affordable establishment do you think <laughs> is often overlooked by tourists? Well... That's a good question. I would say the little bars in the markets. I mean, everybody knows about Cava Baja. If you go to La Cava Baja, you have these great places. Their places are very well known. Uh, some of them are too well known, but perhaps the little bars in the markets, uh, in neighborhood markets. And um, there's also a really big argument to be made for going to small neighborhoods away from the center. If you are in the city center, Plaza Mayor, that's where the tourists are. If you want to be charged less money and perhaps eat better, I would go to neighborhoods, uh, go to other parts of the city, venture out of the center. You can take the subway, it's really easy. And uh, you can find little bars where there's a lot, you know, really pretty decent, pretty decent food. And in the markets, you can find some nice little bars. So that would be perhaps my, my advice. Danny Baker again, uh, what do you think of tapas bars in the UK and the United States? where you have uh, to pay quite a lot for tapas. Yes, I am not that familiar with the ones in the UK, but in the United States, I can tell you they're a rip off and they're not worth the money. It's always very depressing for me when I venture into a Spanish restaurant, except for, I have to make the exception, uh, Chef Jose Andres, I don't know if you're familiar with Chef Jose Andres, he lives in Washington DC, he has a bunch of restaurants um, in, um, yeah, in Washington DC, in Vegas, in different places. I've been to two of his establishments and the food was really, really good. Definitely very expensive. I remember paying for a tapa of paella, the price of a whole paella, right? So it's, wow, okay. It's a very expensive. Um, so what happens is that I make my food at home <laughs> or I wait until I can, I can come to Spain. Usually, I mean, it's very hard, in all fairness, it's very hard to recreate Spanish food abroad. The ingredients are hard to find. Uh, things are not the same, and I understand. I imagine that it's expensive to export a lot of these a lot of these things. In the United States, there's the added problem of people not knowing Spanish food. Mm, people in the United States, for the most part, they think that people food from Spain is the same as food from Mexico, and you have to explain to them oh, it isn't really. <laughs> Um, so there's a, you know, a lack of, a lack of um, branding perhaps, right? The branding is not there. People are not that familiar with food from Spain. So restaurants tend to not to do so well, at least in middle-sized cities like Cincinnati where I live. We don't have any good Spanish restaurants. We used to have one that closed down. So right now there's nothing. If you go to places like Los Angeles or New York, then yeah, or Chicago, you're gonna have better Spanish restaurants. Uh, but uh, it's still, yeah, work in progress, let's say. <laughs> Rossi Bel Guzman asks, which neighborhood would you recommend in Madrid to, to have tapas and to have? 
Yeah, I mentioned Calle Ponzano or Ponzano Street. Ponzano is in P O N Z A N O, Ponzano Street. I would recommend that area. That's really good. Um, and I would recommend uh, perhaps just as far from the center as you can, I guess. Yeah, La Latina, which is yeah, closer to the center. La Latina is a nice place though for, for little places to eat. Yeah. Well, Joan asks, is there a still a strong regional influence in Spanish food or it's becoming more homo homogenized? No, it's still very, very regional, depending on where you go. Uh, Madrid is one thing because, like I said, it's a melting pot and you're going to have people from everywhere and it's a lot more of a mix of things. But if you go to Galicia, if you go to Valencia, if you go to Barcelona, if you go to uh, Sevilla, you're going to have very, very markedly different food. Uh, it has to do with what's traditional. It has to do with what's available. Uh, and people take a lot of pride in what's typical of their region. Um, I was just a few days ago, I went to the mountains of Alicante. I'm in the coast right now. And here in the coast, people eat uh, roth, rices, rice, paella, that's the typical thing. If you go to the mountains, maybe just an hour away, you have very different food traditions. Uh, the mountain is a different space. And uh, even though they make rice dishes, they make uh, oven baked rice, for example, and they add other ingredients. Um, so there's a lot of different things I have never tried, for example. So yeah, people are very proud of their regional dishes. And uh, I think that's going to continue. Mm -hmm. And Hope Charm asks, is it, is it permitted to ask for a specific tapa? For example, if you are vegetarian and do not, do not want to be self meat, or does, uh, does this go against the spirit of tapas? You can say it. I think you should say it. If you don't need me, just say, please, if you're going to give me a tapa, I don't need me. Yeah, just say it. You're the customer after all. If, if you don't eat it, then it defeats the point. They're going to say, why didn't you eat it? So yeah, go ahead and say it. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. It's fine. Also, in some places, you, you I mean, sometimes you get a free tapa with your drink, but also you, if you go to a restaurant, you want to eat different tapas, you order. So you can order whatever you like and don't order whatever you don't want to eat. So perfectly fine. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. We, we don't have any more questions. I'm going to finish with one question for you. If you think in Madrid, what is the typical dish that you can have it? For example, if you think in Malaga, you have the pescadito frito or in Valencia, you have the paella. But in Madrid, what is the typical dish that the, the people have to ask uh, to try? I the guess bocadillo the, de calamares? Yeah, the bocadillo de calamares, <laughs> yes, I guess. I don't know if it's a dish, but yeah, it's definitely something you have to try, this calamari sandwich that near Plaza Mayor, yes. Um, cocido would be the most traditional and the most quintessential Madrid. The problem with cocido is that it's enormous. It's a lot of food. You can see some images there. And uh, it's quite heavy for the summer, for example. So if you go in the winter, yes, definitely cocido. Mm -hmm. um, if not, just different tapas, I guess, callos and things like that. Um, uh, there's some just any different, any tapa, I would say. But cocido, I guess if I was pressed to, to choose one dish, I would say cocido. Mm -hmm. Well, Maria, it was, it was a pleasure to be you here in, in this you. Minuto Cervantes online, but we prefer the next time we can have uh, you here uh, with uh, the typical dish of Madrid in front of us, and we can try it. And for our, our audience, thank you very much to, to be with us this evening. And uh, I hope we can see you soon in other in other conference that we have at this in the Thank yes. you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>